This year, our word is called focus. And, and the Lord wants to bring us to get in focus with Him. And it's not about all this other stuff that goes on in life. But the Lord wants us to become focused on Him. And what we've done in this series, and you can go back and do this. We, I look just as good live as I do on Facebook Live. And, and, and we want you to go back and look at F and O. And we're on the letter U, and it is so such a big topic. And it's called unity. God wants His church to be unified. He wants His people to unify. It's not uniformity, it's unity. I cannot be like you. Some of y'all wear clothes I can't wear. My buddy Randy over there, he's got, he, I mean, he's, I can get in his clothes twice. <laughs> so what happens, I, I, can't be, I can't be like you with my personality. My, my personality, I'm very bashful. <laughs> and, and what happens, I can't be like that. I, I can't. I, 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 there's some of y'all that pull for the New England Patriots. I struggle with that. I mean, I, it was such a struggle for Mike Koeman. He left the team and started pulling for Tampa Bay. I don't know what he's going to do now that Tom Brady's retired. But the church needs to be unified. It needs to come together. And we need to find common ground. So I've been trying to figure out how I can show you this. So let me just show you. Here we go. Watch this. Smarter to travel in groups. That last one was my favorite one. There's some people I can name. So what happens to us is that we need to be unified. And we're better together. In Psalms 133.1, this has been the verse that we've used for the second week in a row. How good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And, and what he teaches us is, is that the Bible talks more about unity of the church than about heaven or hell. He, he knew that we would have a problem in church, that we would struggle to pull people together and to stay on board. And this morning, I want to encourage you to listen to me. And at the end of the sermon, you, you can think what you may, but unity is the key. As a Christian, we have to be unified. So one of the things I learned is that, you know, for us, we, it causes us, if we're going to be unified, and we make our minds up that we're going to be unified, we're going to have to change the way we think. I've discovered that we, we are people that are so influenced by the media and about newspapers and they influence in all the things. That, and often we don't know the facts. And so what the Lord has taught me over the last two or three years is you have to change the way you think. If the church to be in harmony, for the church to be together, it has to reduce all the conflicts of relationships. Relationships are different. Every one of us have different ones in here. And we have to understand that the Lord wants us to stay in harmony, so we've got to change the way we think. 1 Corinthians 10, 32 says, Never do anything that might hurt other Jews, Greeks, or God's church. We, we don't do things to hurt each other. We do things to uplift each other. We do things that we can help. And how do we do it? How can I become a person who changes the way I think and how I see things? 
First, you got to listen to God's word more than the world. The world is not going to answer this question for you. You can buy all the self-help books you want, but the way you solve this problem is by listening to God's word. The other thing is, he tells us, think about what you're thinking about before you say it. What happens in Proverbs 4.23, it says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. I would wish right now, I thought about this this morning, about 4.30 this morning. I wish I could put up on the screen what you're thinking right now. Yeah, and what happens to us is that God is trying to teach us that, that what you think about is what shapes your life. I know a lot of people that I've met, they do nothing but focus on money all the time. They think about it and think about it and think about it. And then God brings people to them to help, and they do nothing with it. Nothing is more valuable to God than his church. That is you and I. So who is, who is my brothers and sisters in Christ? All you have to do is read Romans 10, 9, and 10. For those who've professed their faith in Jesus Christ, that's your brothers and sisters. And you need to focus on that. Well, what about those folks who don't? You need to focus on them too. See, what happens, the only way you can win people for Jesus is to care about them. And and I have a philosophy that I, I wish you would listen to. You have to invest in people to invite them to your church. You have to invest in them to invite them to Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you bring unity into church because God says we're all one group. We're all one group. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. I want to pray right now. And I want us to pray as a unified body sitting in here on live stream. I want us to unify. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. God, help our hearts to change the way we think. Help us to remember how important that when Jesus went to the cross, what he did for us. And Lord, I pray this morning you would guide us in everything we think and say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. So why is church such, uh, why is church unity so important? I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And I, I would, I'd like to just take a moment to, to look at this verse with you and and, and we have another set of verses coming up at, toward the end of the service. I want you to look with me. But in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore I, this is Paul speaking, a prisoner of serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's fault because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself unified in spirit, binding yourself together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to be one glorious hope of the future. You and I, we look at that and we begin to realize what we discussed last week. See, our unity as a church and as individuals prove to other people that we're saved and we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We have in Scripture, in the Old Testament, all the way through, we have the Trinity as the model for unity. Jesus' last prayer in John 17 is that the world, and as Christians, we would live together in unity. God gives glory. He was given glory when you and I are unified together. Unity removes fear and creates boldness for us to share. When we, the church is truly unified, everyone's needs are met. He says that baptism and communion is a visible sign outward saying we're united, we believe. And we find, find things like focus on common ground, purposes, so that we can help each other. I, I just keep on going. I want to give you the last. And Jesus expects me to work hard in unifying Christians. We've got to find common ground. The reason our churches are torn up and the reason we're not making any bigger dents than we are is because we, we want to argue all the time. We want to argue all the time. And God is teaching us is that my part in unity, this is for you and I, my part in unity is this. I have to focus on what is common, not our differences. See, that's the problem. We focus on the negative because we're trained to focus on the negative. You know how I know? How many school teachers do we have in here this morning? We got two or three. 
I love you girls. I love you guys. I knew what negative was because when I got my papers back, it always had these red circles. I thought the first time I saw that, we had common ground. We did have common ground. I was a failure at this stuff. And so what happens, we're trained that way. The media talks about you, like right now, we're talking about the weather, and now they've come up with this thing on WBT, I, that's who I watch, and it says the weather alert. When I hear the word alert, I, I think it's going to be bad. They use the word alert when it's 75 degrees. Bring it on. Bring it on. So what happens is that we don't need to focus on people's differences. We need to focus on common things. Everybody in this room has a different opinion about how to have grits and eggs and bacon, and sausages, and country biscuits. <laughs> I'm about to starve to death. And, and what happens here is that we all have different ways of doing things. And, and we have to learn that it's okay to be different. It's okay that, that you wear blue jeans. I, I prefer my blue jeans with creases in them. I mean, you know, that's a big deal to me. And, and, the, and, the, and the dry cleaners love me. They love my business. So what happens, he says, we're to focus and we're to focus and find common ground. I love our church because it's made up of such diversity among our people. And it, and it really helps us to understand how important it is to do that. Let me just say this. Um, conflict is usually a sign that focus has shifted from to less important issues. When we start battling in the church and we can't find common ground and we can't, we use this because we, we're looking at things that are less important. We, we, we need to stay focused on Jesus just like Peter did when he got out of the boat and walked on the water. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You cannot lose. And we have to learn in church. We, we get into these arguments. The only arguments that you need to have are doctrinal arguments like Jesus is God. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus resurrected. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. On the third day he arose, and he's coming again. These are things that you need to understand how important is that you can be saved by asking Jesus to save you. These are issues that are so important. Listen, we have these other ones that we debate about. It's just like having Bible translations. Man, I, you look at this notes. I got all kind of translations in here. And what we learn is that when you open your Bible, it's all good. It don't care which translation it is. So learn to make sure we find common ground with people. And we learn that history teaches us is that if we stay focused, we win the world. But let me ask you a question. If you change your perspective this morning, would it help you to deal with people from a different view? Would you be able to find common ground with someone who is so, so hurt. You know what I've discovered about hurt people? They hurt people. When we're hurt, we hurt people. So let's do a survey. How many of you in here have ever been upset with your wife, your husband, your children? Well, go, okay, with the preacher too. Uh, how many of you have ever been upset and you, in the middle of that madness, you hurt someone? Would you raise your hand? Okay, just keep them up. We're taking pictures of all this. And, and, and what happens to us is that God wants us to realize when we're hurting, we have to be careful. You know, I don't know about you, but I started asking myself some questions. Instead of asking the question when I meet somebody that, dry, that kind of drives me nuts, what's wrong with them? I need to ask the question, what's wrong with me? I, I need to ask that question to me. What's wrong with me? I, I love what 1 Corinthians 1.10 says. As Paul writes, says, this is from the Living Bible, it says, let there be a real harmony so there's no division in the church. I plead with you to be one mind, united in thoughts and purpose. I've learned that when we have this passion for people and that we begin to focus on it, it changes how we see it. It is our job, you and I as Christians, it is our job to protect the unity of the church. And it needs to start today with us. We need to be people that focus on unity. And, you, and I'll get to the question, well, what happens if someone does? I'll answer that question for you just a little bit. But right now, I want you to focus on unity, finding common ground. I, I love the, this past week, a weekend yesterday, and we had ladies in there knitting, and they're making these little hats, and they've got needles. I don't go around them because they're, I mean, they're liable to stick the preacher, you never know. 
But then there was a group of people. Uh, Ed has one person helping him. We, we've, the Lord's blessed us. We're getting ready to put us a new uh, well, it's a used box. But it's a welcome center we've been praying over for 10 years. Literally, we have. I was in, let me just tell you this story. You need to hear this. Let me tell you how God works. If you decide you're going to make your mind up that you're going to trust him and you're going to try to find unity and you're going to learn to quit trying to have things your way. Uh, we, were, uh, we were in Hobby Lobby. I know you can't believe that. There's one near you. It's not on, put on Sunday, but there's one. And we've been praying for about 10 years, literally. We wanted to build a, a welcome center in the focus of the room. And every time we do this, I, I kind of turned this over to Jim Johnson. And um, Elvis was helping me trying to figure this thing out. And, and, and the last time we bid was $5,000. Well, listen. We can't do that here. We, we, can't, we got too many other things. And so we can just put a table and put a cover on it. It looks good. And so we're in Hobby Lobby. Me and Sandy and Anita, um, they make me go. They held me hostage and made me go in there. And uh, so we're in there and we're looking around. And, and they were getting, as a matter of fact, we were getting stuff uh, for my office and for part of this prop that you're going to see shortly. And all of a sudden I heard them say something about this, this desk. And I said, I heard him say, Barry, you need to come over here. What would you think I did? I went over there. And, and, and it had on there, it was, it's nine foot long, nine inches, and it, and it said, for sale, you're going to love this. $25. <laughs> and I just walked off and left them. They didn't know where. I went and found the, the guy who's the manager of the store. His name's Scott. Scott, where's Scott? Because I wanted to buy it on the spot. And so we got it, and Scott said, is 25 too much? I said, no, I think we're good. We're good. And I, he said, well, we can, you got your truck with you? I mean, that's how much we shop in Hobby Lobby when the man knows you have a truck. And so we were in there, and, and I said, yeah, I said, I got my truck. Can I pull around when you help me load it up? So he's got these four humongous guys. They got muscles this big, and they pick it up like it ain't nothing. And so they slide on my truck, and they say, is there anything else you can do for, we can do for you? I said, yeah, you can get in your vehicles and drive to the church and help me unload it. <laughs> I'm trying to find common ground with these people. You follow where I'm going here? <laughs> well, they wouldn't help me, but we got it on the truck, and, and, and it's so heavy, and I had strapped it down. Of course, it probably didn't tie it tight enough, and we're coming back this way, and this guy pulls up and says, hey, your strap's not, it's, it's, it's loose back there, and I'm going, like, this thing weighs 500 pounds like it's going to go somewhere, you know. So we get to the church, and I'm, I'm calculating, you know, this is important. I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get this thing unloaded. You know, we don't have Hercules or Chuck, all them people, you know. We don't have all that. So we, we, we come, I've turned the truck around, back it up, and I'm waiting on the praise team to come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we were doing a team building thing. That's what this was, yeah. It was a team building thing. Thank God they came. And we got it off, and Ed and, and got everything took care of yesterday. But I want to say, it is our job to protect unity. Desire to help lift each other up. Let me give you the second one. i got to continue to work at unity. I, I, you're never going to stop working on this. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep yourself. You, you need to realize that you're not an accident. And everything that you see and talk to people is because God has planned it. There's a purpose for everything that you do and everything you say and everywhere you go. Make every effort. So when you wake up in the morning, you need to have a different thought process. And you need to say, God, let me make a difference today. And our, our little tagline that comes from our church, make every day count. That's just what I've been trying to preach for 12 years here. We need to make every day count and matter because one day we're going to stand before the Lord and he's going to ask us what we did. And I don't want to disappoint him. But let me give you a couple of cautions. If you're going to really work at it, you're going to have to remove a couple of things out of, your, out of your mind. One is this. Don't, don't bring worldly values into the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 3 through 5 says, Because you are still worldly as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you. You're worldly living in the human standards, aren't you? Paul is real clear. He's trying to remind them that it, he, he, everybody, it takes all of us to lead people to Christ. Statistically, it says that 86 people lead one person to Christ, and we need to get after it. 
He says, Apollo, he does this, and I do this, and everybody works together unified. And see, why we do this is the reason I'm telling you, some, sometimes in our lives, we have these, we get idols on our, in, in front of us. And we, we idolize celebrities and sports figures. And the only person you need to be idolizing is Jesus. He is the truth, the way, and life. He's what will give you the answers to all the problems that you have. See, it's about character. You know, I struggle sometimes. I don't do everything right. Matter of fact, I'm the kingpin sinner in this room. Because what happens is that you're trying to do everything you can, but we have to work at it. And then what we can do to remove division among Christians and among churches is when we quit worrying about things that's not important. Paul, he tells us this, that there's a right way of doing things. So don't put your worldly values in. And, and then the second thing, there's a caution. Um, don't get sucked into these worldly fights. There's a, there's a fight going on all the time. If you're in politics, there's, a, there's an argument. If you're down here playing softball, there's an argument. If you've got kids playing sports, there's an argument. There's, but that's because we live in a world that's broken and people are broken. And God wants us to be people that look and stay out of stuff that's not our business. John 18, 36 says, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So don't let it become your world. Jesus wants us to focus on heaven. He tells us in 2 Timothy 2, keep away from foolish and ignorant or arrogant arguments. Stay away from those things. I've seen people in my family, I'm just going to tell you growing up, me and Janice, we can tell you, we used to stand outside and watch them. They would rather argue than, than eat. And so while they were in there arguing, we would go eat. We don't like it today. So I'm just telling you, don't get all sucked up in these things, these battles and stuff. But let me tell you what Christians need to speak up about. You don't have to be ugly. God don't need you to be a salesman. He don't need you to defend for him. He just needs you to be you. We need to speak up for the elderly. We need to speak up for the unborn. We need to speak up for the poor. We need to speak up for people that are in prison. We need to speak up for people that are immigrants. We need to speak up for people that need help, who don't know what to do. And what's happened, we are people that need to speak up and to help people. Do you know there's over 2,000 verses in Scripture that speaks about helping people, standing up just and fairly? You and I can lead that example. We can lead that example. And he tells us to stay out of these quarrels, but speak up for truth. Help us. Our church on March the 6th, uh, we have a lady coming to speak just for a few moments about the pregnancy center. We, this is an issue in York County. It's an issue in America. And it is up to the church to get involved in this and to help people. He tells us all the time. But we are going to have people say we shouldn't do that. My friends, that's not true. If there's a problem in this world, we need to give them Jesus. That's the answer. And he teaches us that. So what happens then in this is that unity is, is the soul of fellowship. Destroy it, and you'll rip the heart of Christ's body out. Number three is that my part in unity is I need to be realistic about my expectations of others. You ever notice that, that you and I have expectations of other people that's, his, that's up here? Okay, you with me? This is where you say amen. Go ahead. And then my, our expectations of ourselves are down here, right? Say, oh, me. Okay. So what happens, you need to lower that expectation. You can't expect people to be something you ain't. You, you can't no more tell somebody how to go somewhere where you ain't never been. You say, well, that's not true. I can go on Google and pull it all up. Let me tell you, if you give it to me, I'm still going to get lost. You, you have to understand that. That we need to be realistic about things. I, I want to share a true story with you. And, it's a, and it, it happened in, and this in Charlotte. And it, it was about a young lady who, uh, she, got, she, was, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. She had been a nightclub singer and all the things that go with that. And she was now a Christian, had a tremendous voice. And so the, the person who led her to Christ was a lady who lived in the same complex, who prayed for her, encouraged her, gave her scripture, and spent time and did everything to win this girl to Christ. And so she took her to her church. And, of course, she doesn't 
dressed the way the church dressed. Oh, by the way, she'd never been to church either. She didn't have all those rules and regulations and all that format. And so she goes. And of course, it started with it was okay. Then finally one day, the, the pastor, the youth, the, the worship leader said, I, I want you to sing. I've heard you sing. I don't know how that happened, but he heard her sing. And, and so what happened? She sang. And did, oh, man, knocked it. This knocked it out of the ballpark. And someone in the church, this person who got out of their lane, went to her and said, you know, you shouldn't be up there like that, dressed the way you are. That's the people we slap around here. I just want you to know. Man, stay in your lane. What happens is that I understand when you win people for Jesus Christ, here's the mistake that we make as Christians. We're expecting them to be 25-year veterans overnight. I ain't even close to being the kind of Christian that people in this church are. And we've got to realize that people need encouragement. What we do is we need to let love guide our lives, and it needs to guide our mouth most of all. So we need to understand to expect that any church to always do everything right and the minister to be perfect to everyone at all times, that's a fantasy. That's a fa it doesn't happen. But it's not a reason to quit. We have to remember we're all together. We're sinners saved by grace on our way to heaven. And we live in a world where everything's broken. No one can get along. we got to be the church that steps up and starts today doing it. Love each other as if your life depended on it. Love makes up practical, will just fix anything. Reconciliation is the goal that Christ has. Now listen to me a second. God has things he wants to teach you in your church. If you're a member of Carolina Cornerstone Church and where you're attending this church, you're with people who think differently than you. They have different backgrounds. Man, there's, and when you look around, there's so many different kinds of folks here. We ain't all the same. You know, y'all remember Groucho Marx, some of you old folks like me? Yeah, Groucho Marx said he wouldn't join any club that would take him. <laughs> <laughs> One of my heroes in the faith is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you know anything about him, he's such a powerful voice. I could just get you to read some of his stuff. One of his most famous books is Grace is Not Cheap. But he also wrote a book called, it's, it's called Life Together. He was a German pastor. He was killed for standing up against Nazis and the Hitler organizations. And he was filled and he was trying to make sure that Jesus Christ was put first. Without Christ, he knew there would be discord. And that's why Germany was in the mess that it was. Because they had looked to a human versus God Almighty to solve their problems in Germany. As you get to looking through that, Bonhoeffer forgives it all for the cause of Christ for doing what is right. See, I want to say this to you this morning about unity. The sooner you give up these illusions that a church has to be perfect in order to love it, give that up. The sooner you, you, you're going to quit pretending and start admitting that we're all imperfect and we all need grace. Let me give you number four. I got to hustle just a little bit here. My part in unity is that I need to offer encouragement instead of criticism. Let's practice. That's why we're here. I want you to turn to your neighbor and if, and if turn to your neighbor and, and just say something nice to him, encourage him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you. You're awesome. You, you don't see, see, don't you feel better? Some of you husbands and wives, this is the first time you've said anything nice to each other today. <laughs> and and what, what, what happens, we need to encourage, the, the Bible says, Proverbs 16, 21 says it this way. A wise man, mature person, is known for his understanding. Uh, the more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. Wow. Encouraging words help people. Instead of them being dragged down, you say encouraging words and lift them up. And they begin to understand. Listen, this is the mark of Christianity. And for us Christians, it's to learn 
there's a skill in talking to people about where they are in life. I tell you, people often get fall, they fall out with each other and they you just go back to the word Matthew 18 tells us how to solve these problems. It, it, when you read Matthew 18, it tells us how to do this. But it didn't tell you how fast to move either. If you have a problem with someone, pray for them. And then go to them. And pray with them and encourage them. And what you'll begin to realize is that he helps us. I've learned this as a pastor. I failed in this area too, so let me say that up front. I've never, I am never pers um, persuasive if I'm abrasive. I, you, can't, you can't convert people. You can't help convert or point them in the right direction, I like to say, if you don't treat people equally or fair or kind. You couldn't jump it on me. I, I ain't paying no attention either. That's just how his life is. But there's over 100 pieces of scripture that will tell us that we need to encourage and not criticize. So when we keep moving, I've learned this. When I criticize and I don't encourage, I lose fellowship with God. That's a fact. When you don't encourage, you're, you're sinning. The Bible says to encourage. So if you don't encourage, guess what it is? S-I-N. You need to know that. And then number two, I expose my own pride and insecurity. The reason we fight with people is because we're insecure about the situation. And then the third one is I set myself up to be judged by God. Let, let, me, let, me, let me help you with this. If you say, well, I, I think you can judge people. Let me tell you why. Let me help you. If I'm going to judge Todd White, Mark Connors, Bill Grantham, Bill Grantham is easy for me to judge. No, I'm just kidding. If I'm going to judge those three men, i got to judge them as if God judges them. I'm not qualified. And when we get this, we begin to understand is that the way God teaches us is that we, we don't judge people. We pray for people. We encourage people. And when we get an opportunity, we guide them to Scripture, not what we think. See, what happens the devil's job has taught us how to complain, grumble, gripe, all that stuff. And when you start doing this for the Satan, Satan takes a vacation and lets you do it. And you're doing it without pay. And what the Lord teaches us is we have choices to make this morning in unity. Are you going to live a life that's self-centered? Or are you going to live a life that's Christ-centered? In our Christian culture, we need to understand, we need to be sympathetic, as 1 Peter 3, 8 says. Be sympathetic and love each other as a family. Have compassion and be humble. We need to sympathize and empathize with people. Because we don't know. This morning, there's no way. As many people as I spoke to, I have no idea what you've gone through this morning. If you have kids, I do. I remember those days. It's been a long time ago. But the thing I'm trying to say to you, I have no idea what you're going through. I do not know how what happened in your home this morning. I don't know what happened as you were driving from, maybe you're from Rock Hill, and you were driving to Fort Mill. There's crazy people out there driving. I just want to. So let me say this about your church, about our church, about wherever you go to church. If you're not in church, we want you to be here. We love you. Divorcing your church at the first sign of disappointments or disillusion is a mark of immaturity. It's a mark of immaturity. We are so divided in our country. We're arguing about politics. We're arguing about COVID, about wearing masks. We're divided on racism. We're divided on so many kind of different issues. And you and I have got to be as Christians. What does the word of the Lord say? What does the Bible teach us about this? I want us to change the way we think. I want us to be people that, you know, let me, let me, let me pick on somebody here for a second. Um, my cousin Janice, I get to pick on her because she's kin to me. But I'm going to pick on her husband, Chuck. Uh, Chuck married my cousin. I had the pleasure of marrying them. He's the funniest thing I've ever been around in my entire life. It was the funniest wedding I've ever been to. I was there, and it was amazing because I handed Chuck the ring to put on, on Janice's finger. He drops it. I've never had that happen before. I'm jumping back going, where's the ring? You say, what was so funny? That he was in, you're embarrassing. No, he made it so funny that everybody in the audience started laughing because you know why? 
because he, he did his best. How many times have I made mistakes? And I wasn't even trying to make a mistake, nor was he. How many times have I done, and everybody looked at me and pointed the finger. And what we learned was this. I love Chuck, and he knows that. We have a little joke. I tell him, hey, cousin Chuck, I hug on him. And the reason I do it is because I love him. And I'm so proud of him and what he has become and what, how he's taking care of Jan, my cousin. I, I'm proud of him for that. And so this is what happens. We encourage each other. Now he teaches these guys that are getting ready to get married. He tells them, grab that ring and hold on tight. So let me have some fun. I am so compelled about the, the word of God. I'm so compelled that what the Lord wants us to do is we as, as, as this church, you and I, we have, a, we have a part in unity as a church. I don't care if you're a member or visiting. I don't care. We love you. We want you to be a part of this church. So here's what we're going to do this morning. Going to do it real quick. I'm going to show you something. This morning the Lord gave me at 2 o'clock in the morning the other morning. He gave this to me. And, and this is this. Carolina's cornerstone part in unity is that we commit ourselves to building each other up. If I could get you to turn with me into the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 1. And I'm reading this from the message translation, and it, because it's one of my favorite, and it says it so well. But, but it says for you and I, we need to commit. That means we decide we're going to do this no matter what. Romans 14, 1 from the Message Bible says, Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Holy moly. What if this church this morning began to write, everybody in this room began to write one person during the week, just a note of encouragement? Oh, I, we have the best card committee Folks who, uh, Jean and her team, send cards to people all over the United States of encouragement. But what if we did it here in our church and we started writing a card for each one of us? I don't write cards. I will call you so fast. I will jot you a text just encouraging you. And, and what happens is, is that you and I have to be a people that in this church, that we have to be people that will come along and be united. It, we have to be a church that wants to do things that will help each other. That will guide us through all the things that we're doing. And he wants us to be people that commit. The Sawyer, come up here and help me unite this church, buddy. Good job. Y'all give Sawyer a big hand. And he says that we're committing this. So now we have that beautiful Carolina Cornerstone green. We have part of Clemson's color purple. I know that's what Melanie's going to tell me after church. I cheated. The second thing, we need to recognize the value of every person. Do you know that every person in this room is valuable? You know how I know? Because God made you. You say, well, you don't know my history. I don't need to know your history. God don't make junk. So turn to your neighbor and say, God, don't make junk. The Bible says in Romans 14, 2 through 4, it says, For instance, a person who's been around for a while might not well be conceived that he can eat anything on the table, while others in different backgrounds might say, you need to be a vegetarian. I ain't in that group, I can tell you that. Show me the beef. But everybody here is valuable. We need to show people how important they are. We don't, need to have, we don't have the right to judge another person. We have the right to encourage. We have the right to make a difference. We have a right that we need to do this. So Olivia, would you come and help, me, help us unify our church? What a pretty color. Give her a big hand. That looks good. 
Number three, keep our focus on what is important. What is the most important thing that you can do as an individual is point people to Jesus Christ. Romans 14, 6 and 8 says this. What's important is that all that you keep a holy day and keep God safe. If God were the answer to all the ways of life, to death, everything in between, we're not, we don't need each other. So what we say is we, we need to be people who work together, who come together, quit splitting up over trivial things. Be a leader of unity. Be, be, be willing to do whatever it takes. Be willing to pray for Mark and Stacy as they go all over the world as missionaries. Be willing to pray for our folks here in our church who go to Uganda. Pray for our folks who are in this church who go to the prisons. Pray for those folks who go and do our bread ministry. See, there's so much here. We got to quit splitting up over trivial things. Connie, would you come and help us unite this church? Let's give her a big hand. She, she poured the Carolina Hornets, Charlotte Hornets in there. Number four, I want to teach you this. If, if, if we're going to do it as a church, and we are, we are a church, if you're here this morning, maybe you're visiting with us and you have a church, this is, it pertains to you too, just like this. We need to exercise our authority with wisdom and out of love for each other. Romans 14, 11, 12, you're, you're critical. You can sit, can, all these things that happen we aren't going to improve your position one bit. So I love what it says here. Will you roll up for me just for a second? It says this. It says, so mind your own business. You've got your hands full. Just take care of your own life before God. Matter of fact, can, let me this. Every day I think about this and pray for folks. One day... Every person in this room is going to stand before the Lord. And when I get there, he is not going to ask me about Randy Turney. Thank God. <laughs> He's not going to ask me about Randy. He's just going to ask me about Barry. I got enough problems. I got enough problems. See, we need to understand that you and I need to be aware of folks' problems in life. I understand that. But we need to be people that pull together, work hard, stay together, do everything we can. Mike, would you come and help us to unify our church? Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Number five, commit ourselves to not to force our opinion on other people. Romans 14, 19 says it this way. So let us agree to use all our energy to get along with each other. Help others with encouraging words and don't drag them down finding fault. You say, so I can't say anything negative? Why would you? Why, why would you find anything negative? You need to be looking for the good things, and you need to find. Today at 1.30, I have a funeral I'm doing for a man who I adore and love who passed away. And, and one of the things I would say about Mac is this, is that Mac always, I never saw him one time treat anybody except good and kind. You see, this is the kind of stuff that the Lord is trying to teach us, is that you and I need to be people that are always committed. Not to for, I don't need to force people to, to know Jesus Christ. I just need to be the real thing in front of them. I need to be kind. I make it a point that everybody I talk to, I try. Sometimes I, I mess up. I, I, I don't always get it perfect. Sometimes I'm in an anger moment. It, so let's do a so How many of you got anger this week? Raise your hand. You're getting ready to get some more of it. Too. So what happens is that anger, sometimes it, respond, it, it affects how we respond to people. And he says to you and I, Jesus didn't approve of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the ain't no seeds. 
He just kept talking about the love of God. He kept showing what it was like, how important it was. And Ms. Linda, would you come and help us this morning to unite this church? He's my partner in crime. Yeah, yeah. Would you help us this morning? Let's give her a big hand. <laughs> then number six, last one. Live by faith. Live by faith. Live by faith. And he says, cultivate your relationships with God. Don't impose it on others. He, he tells us that we need to be people who live by faith and faith alone. I've watched this church since I've been here grow and be so deep in debt. Few people coming and we survive because God has blessed us. It's because it's the faith of the founders of this church. It is our responsibility to move forward and keep that going. That we don't give up. That we realize we're not a perfect church. There's nothing here. If you're perfect this morning, we're going to ruin you. Because no one's perfect. Does everybody do it? Hey, I, I don't even. If someone says, how did you get through seminary with Greek and Hebrew? It was by the grace of God. And it was even worse in college when I had to take Latin. But what the point I'm trying is God uniquely made me as he made you unique. My faith affects you and your faith affects me. And we need to pull together to do this. Ben, would you come and, and, and help us unite our church? Ben did good, didn't he? Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, my brother. And so what I want to do today is I want you to, I want to challenge you. He said, what are you doing with the loop? I want to challenge you. It is your responsibility to pr promote and protect the unity of the church, no matter where it is. And when we, we do this, we begin to realize you just add a little more in here. I love green. Have you ever noticed that in your church? You just add a little bit more, and our lives change. You see, when you look at this now, See all the colors? You, you see the colors that makes a difference? They are colors of all kinds of people, walks of life. You and I need to be people who look like unified people. Help us to focus this week on unifying people. Not being critical. Trying to find common ground. Encourage. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray for you this morning. I, I, I want you to know that this altar is open at any time while we're praying. But you come and just find your place if you need to. Maybe you're struggling in an area we talked about today. Maybe you're struggling in that area, and I want to encourage you to come and give it to the Lord. Father, I just... As we looked at your scripture today, we want your church to be that thermometer that just looks like we're just moving through culture and helping. Help us to be a thermostat. Help us to set culture, not follow our culture. Help us to change culture when it's wrong. We want to be able to turn the temperature up and down. We don't want to cause problems. I pray that we would make a new commitment as a church, regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our race, regardless of our politics, our economic standards, our gender, that we would be people that would be so in love. God, this is a very conservative church, and we want to follow everything your word says. We believe your word. We believe it from the front, back. God, we even believe the maps that's in there. God, you've created the church for a reason. And then just appoint people to you. Let us be instruments of unity this morning. And then, Lord, maybe there's someone here who's never received the promises of salvation. And, Lord, I pray this morning, if we would just confess our sins to you, 
I ask you to come into our hearts and save us. Help us to turn every part of our life over to you. God, help us to be grateful for your son Jesus for what he did at the cross. And Lord, I humbly commit our lives to you this morning that our church will be a different church today. We won't be the same as we were as we came in. We'll go out with unity on our mind. We'll encourage, not criticize. We'll lift up instead of push down. And Lord, this morning I pray that we would see things your way. Help us to love you and to trust you and to walk with you. Lord, teach us how to help people without being mean and critical. What we say makes a difference. God, our words can speak life and our words can speak death. Help us to be speaking for you today. Lord, while we're just waiting just for a moment, if there's someone who needs to be prayed over, talked about, Lord, I pray today would be that day.